All right, everybody. So in the first, um, I guess, series I did on Japanese history, I traced or attempted to, to trace to the best of my ability uh, the history of Japanese civilization from, you know, prehistory, so like the Stone Age, up until 1868. So the Meiji Restoration or Revolution, whatever term you want to use to kind of define that period. So what I would like to do in this series is, you know, as the title of the series suggests, go from 1868, roughly, and go up basically to the modern day. Uh, so some videos are going to be basically a chronological discussion, some videos are going to be more thematic. Um, and the early chunk of this series, probably the first four or five videos, is going to overlap with the last four or five videos of the previous series. Um, and I'm also going to have another series specifically dedicated to the development and function of Japan's colonial empire and the development of Japanese imperialism during the, during the late 19th century and the 1910s, 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, all of which are going to work together to kind of give you a better picture and a more complete understanding of Japanese civilization. So before we get started with this video... Uh, in case you haven't watched the other series, which I would encourage you to do, just a brief rundown of how we get to where we are in about 1600. So between 1180 and 1185, there's a multi-pronged civil war in Japan between these leading uh, aristocratic clans. So principally the Taira and the Minamoto, although there are others. Um, these are aristocratic clans who were given, I guess, authority by the court, probably would be the best way to describe it, basically allowing them to go to the frontiers of the Japanese Empire and attempt to pacify the regions. And they're doing this by bringing their own uh, conscript militaries with them. They're doing this by bringing the, technically speaking, national conscript military with them. And they're also hiring these violent individual frontier people uh, and binding those people to the clans with oaths of loyalty, promises of reward, land, stuff like that, to go fight for them. So these people, this last group, is basically what develops uh, eventually into the Japanese samurai. So the Minamoto win. The result is the Kamakura Bakufu, this period of samurai rule, which lasts between depending on where you want to place the start of the Kamakura Bakufu, either 1180, 1183, or 1185, and it goes up until 1333. Um, it's during this period that the Mongolians attempt their invasion of Japan twice. They fail. And this, combined with some other factors, leads to like political destabilization in Japanese society, with the result being that between 1333, the Kamakura Shogunate, or Bakufu, if you want to use that term, collapses, it kind of goes by the wayside, and then between 1333 and 1392 we have this period um, of northern and southern courts fighting each other, where basically there was still samurai in Japan, but there's not really a bakufu, there's not really like this structured, centralized samurai government. The imperial family is attempting to get power back, but there's issues and they break into a civil war which lasts about 60 years. This period of civil war ends, um, you know, like you can see on the screen, technically speaking, 1392. Really, if you want to be really, really technical about Japanese politics, it kind of sort of ends in like 1338 when the imperial family gives Ashikaga Takauji the authority and the blessing to establish a new shogunate. So, like, technically that's in charge, but there's still Imperial family members fighting with each other, but everything really ends in 1392, officially, um, when the courts are basically forced to make peace. So then between 1338, coinciding with the Northern-Southern court period, and going up until 1574, uh, we have the Ashikaga, or the uh, Muromachi Bakufu. So this is like the second period of samurai rule. Between 1467 and 1477, there are succession disputes, a civil war breaks out largely in the Japanese capital of Kyoto, this is the Onin War, and this kind of leads into the famous uh, Sengoku Jidai. So, what, what you'll notice here is that 
there are different periods of Japanese history that kind of overlap with each other and that kind of exist inside one another. This is part of what makes Japanese history a pain to study, is how do you break up the past? There are multiple different periodizations depending on what you're trying to do. Um, so the Sengoku Jidai, this era of the country in a mass civil war, ends around 1600 when the Tokugawa family is able to uh, win the Battle of Sekigahara and they establish what's called the Great Peace. So this lasts then the Tokugawa or the Edo Bakufu. Um, it lasts between 1600 and 1868 or 1867, depending on how you, again, break things up. Uh, but this is like the period of samurai peace. This is the stereotypical period, um, unless otherwise stated or denoted in popular culture that you will see Japan usually depicted as, is the Edo period. Um, and this is where we're going to start because developments in the Edo period heavily impact the Meiji Restoration, which then heavily impacts the development of Japanese imperial institutions in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. So with that kind of very broad, you know, depiction of Japanese history, let's get going. Okay, so on October 20th, 1600, the forces of Tokugawa Ieyasu win the Battle of Sekigahara. So Sekigahara, typically if you look at like popular culture, so stuff like video games, movies, manga, anime, the list probably goes on. Even, you know, this, this bleeds into like non-Japan specific uh, textbooks and history books about this period in general. Sekigahara is depicted as this, like, massive, gigantic battle where you have the forces of the Tokugawa on one side and the forces of the uh, Toyotomi clan on the other, basically duking it out to see who's going to be the top samurai and who's going to be the top samurai family at the end of the day and who then is basically going to, in effect, control Japan along with the emperor. It's usually depicted as this grand battle. Uh, a lot of the research coming out of Japan right now suggests that this is, you know, not that Sekigahara wasn't, like, important, but that maybe its significance has been overstated. By 1575, a unified Japan really is not in question. It's something that's going to happen. It just depends who's going to be the ultimate unifier. Um, and Sekigahara also appears to have been new research is showing kind of this, like, lackluster, tawdry affair where there was a battle, but it wasn't... It wasn't overly chaotic. It wasn't overly grand. There was no, like, cult of the offensive where there was attack, attack, attack until the battle's over. Um, it goes in fits and stops and starts, and eventually, for a multitude of reasons, the Tokugawa win. So, when they win this battle... They are more or less in charge, and then in 1603, Tokugawa Ieyasu was granted the title of Shogun uh, by the Emperor. So he's basically given command over all of the military powers of Japan. It's understood that, you know, he's going to try to work with the imperial institutions to govern Japan, but really, it's the Shogun who really controls everything. The Emperor's kind of there in just like a ceremonial role. Uh, so the Edo Bakufu is set up. So his base is this small fishing village of Edo. This eventually develops into the modern metropolis of Tokyo. And because his base is the Edo village, this is where the term Edo period or Edo Bakufu or Edo Shogunate, depending on how you want to break it up, how you want it to find it, comes into play. Uh, so what's important here, as far as shogunal government is concerned, is that the Tokugawa represent a new level of political organization and political power that previous shogunates didn't really exercise. And this is perhaps demonstrated most aptly in the fact that the Tokugawa assert the supreme right to issue laws and collect taxes. So they have a dual power base. So when you study Japanese history, this thing um, where it's just the emperor, or just the king, or just the shogun, or just uh, uh, 
powerful regional lord in charge and nobody else, like we might typically think of with, like, medieval Europe, or the absolutist monarchies in Europe in the 1700s, uh, but that doesn't exist. There is never and has never ever been in Japanese history and Japanese civilization one power base. There is always at least two. It's always at least a dual power system. So what we're seeing here is that dual power structure still in existence. The emperor and the shogun have to cooperate with each other, but really for the first time, the shogun has the upper hand, and the Emperor not so much. Um, and this really comes through with the fact that the Tokugawa are able to assert the supreme right to issue laws and collect taxes. If a lord or somebody wants to do something in his own territory, that's fine. You can have, like, some local laws, you can have some local tax collections, but if you want to do anything more than that, you need to get the express written permission of the Tokugawa. Like, for example, if you want to... I don't know, expand your castle. You have to get the permission of the Tokugawa to do that. So this is how they're able to really control everybody else. And what you see here on the bottom chunk of the screen is between 1603 and uh, 1868. These are all of the shoguns that the Tokugawa family produce. And their power is pretty much uncontested, which is very unique for the shogunal governments. There are problems with that as we get towards the end of the Tokugawa shogunate, but they're able to exert this power through ultimate military strength, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, um, and the construction of a very specific kind of lord-vassal relationship between the Tokugawa shogunate and the regional lord, so the daimyo. So, in setting up these power structures and these defensive networks, uh, what do the Tokugawa do? So they use two forms of integration. They use horizontal integration, which we'll talk about here, uh, and then they use vertical integration, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So what horizontal integration basically is, is it's looking at the social, whatever term you want to use, class, organizational unit, whatever, so in this case, the samurai and the daimyo. So these are all like the warrior people in Japan. So they're all kind of on this plane. And the Tokugawa are saying, okay, well, we're up here. Everybody's below us, but we're not going to structure this kind of like a pyramid. What we're going to do is structure it more like a line. So all of the daimyo are kind of equated with one another. It's just like the Tokugawa are like the first among equals kind of thing. Um, so after the Battle of Sekigahara, what they do is those daimyo are broken up into fudai and uh, tozama daimyo. So the fudai daimyo are the lords that fought with the Tokugawa at the Battle of Sekigahara, the tozama daimyo are the people that fought against them. So what they do is they seize all of their land, and then they redistribute it based on who is loyal to them, who is not. Um, and the system basically works out where Japan kind of looks like a checkerboard, where you have these estates of Tozama daimyo surrounded by Fudai daimyo, um, with the understanding that the Fudai basically keep the Tozama daimyo in check, but at the very ends of Japan, so in the island of Kyushu, Shikoku, the very end of Honshu, this is where the Tozama daimyo basically are uh, in existence and not surrounded, because they're so far, where the, the, the reasoning was, well, these people are so far from the center of power, that even if there was a rebellion, they can't do much. Um, so that's how the lords are kind of broken up and, and integrated into the system. Now, I have also on the screen here, you know, the stuff about Koku. So what is that? Um, well, Japan's at peace now, so there's not really a need for samurai, but the samurai still exist. So how do you use the samurai, this warrior class, or this warrior status group, if there's no wars to be fought? How do you ensure that they have enough resources to basically survive to make them useful to you, but not enough resources to, you know, kind of launch a rebellion or anything else? And the answer is that you convert wealth into koku. So all of these daimyo have their big landed estates, um, and they have their samurai retainers. So basically what 
that happens with the samurai is they're kept by their daimyo lords, so they're still their vassals, uh, but they're basically divested of their land. So now, the lords, the daimyo, are collecting all of this tax and all of this income via rice, and they're parceling it out to all the samurai. And this parceling out of the rice basically is koku. So a koku is, in theory, enough rice to keep one man alive for a year. So the taxes are collected in terms of koku, and then they're parceled out. Um, so what does this do for the samurai? Well, it gives them enough resources that they basically don't die of starvation, and they're able to devote themselves to learning and martial arts to basically become good administrators and, and you know, bureaucrats for their lords, but they don't have actual cash money or any other form of resource to channel into some kind of a rebellion. They're paid in food. So that's how all of that works. So on top of all of this, the Tokugawa have three uh, cadet branches. So the understanding with this is that well, if the Tokugawa main family doesn't have like a shogunal heir, then those three cadet branches can basically provide an heir if they need to. So we have that going on. So it's kind of hierarchical, but like not really, because all these people are still daimyo, they're still samurai, they're just being reworked into a new system. There's, there's not necessarily like an overt hierarchy here. Now on top of all of this to keep track of population, uh, what do you have to do? Well, the Tokugawa basically order everybody in the vicinity of a Buddhist temple to go there and basically fill out like a census. You have to register yourself at the Buddhist temple. If you have a family member born to you, you have to go register them at the temple. So this is kind of like keeping a census. It allows the Tokugawa to keep track of the entire population, at least in theory, of the Japanese islands. And it also allows the regional lords to assess taxes. So we have that going on. So this is part of the Tokugawa control system. Now how do we deal with the emperor? Well, what the Tokugawa do with the emperor is they look at the past couple centuries of Japanese history and they say, okay, well, if the shogunal government ever has problems, usually what happens is the imperial family kind of rises up and tries to take power back for themselves and kind of get rid of the shogunate. How do we prevent that from happening? Well, we establish a castle in Kyoto, where the emperor lives. We establish armed guards loyal to the Tokugawa in that castle to oversee the emperor and protect him from harm. So, they are in theory working with the imperial family and the imperial institutions, but in reality, um, the emperor basically is kept under like lock and key day and night 24-7. Um, and this allows the Tokugawa to exert basically full control over the imperial family and the court nobility who now must devote themselves to cultural pursuits to kind of present themselves as a ideal for the rest of Japan to aspire to be like. So before we get going with the vertical integration stuff, I just want to talk a little bit more about uh, all these daimyo families and the cadet branches. So by at least 1750-ish, uh, there's about 200 daimyo families. This number kind of goes up and down throughout this period as some families piss off the shogun and they lose their land, as some families are created um, basically from scratch, as new cadet branch families are created. So it stays around 200 daimyo families, but it, it goes up and down a little bit. Um, now, I mentioned that there were uh, three cadet branches for the Tokugawa family, whose job basically is to, if the Tokugawa family doesn't have like an immediate heir, provide an heir to the shogunal seat. So those three cadet families are seated in uh, the provinces of Ki, Mito, and Owari. So these are their power bases. And these three families are basically at the edges of the Tokugawa-controlled land. So, the Tokugawa basically are in the center of the Japanese islands, and everybody else is kind of pushed out. With the idea, again, being that if there's a problem, like an actual serious problem, like a rebellion or something, if that were to ever happen, um, 
the rebellious lord would be at the edge of the Japanese island, so there's not really an issue because they can't really go anywhere. Um, there's over 150 Fudai Daimyo, and there's over 100 Tozama Daimyo, at, at least. So, like I said, that number of 200 Daimyo kind of goes up and down. By about 1750, there's over 200. It goes up a little bit to about 250. It goes down a little bit, depending on what decade or what period you're really looking at. Um, but just to give you an idea of how much land these people actually control and how much and how many, you know, resources these guys are actually able to muster, um, I mentioned a minute ago that land is now assessed in terms of koku, the amount of rice that can be produced and given to a man for one year to ensure he doesn't die of starvation. Uh, the Owari, Ki, and Mito cadet families own land which collectively produces 619,000, 555,000, and 350,000 cocoa a year. So this is a crapload of rice. This is a lot of resources that one area is able to really produce. The Fudai Daimyo control between 10 and 100,000 uh, cocoa producing units of land per year. The Tozama Daimyo have usually over 100,000 cocoa. So these guys are extraordinarily wealthy, but the Tokugawa one-up everybody because they have land which produce millions of cocoa a year. So my, my point with this is to really demonstrate that, yeah, these other branches might be moderately wealthy. They might have over 100,000 cocoa of rice produced a year, which if they needed to, they could, I guess, go to a money changer and convert the rice into, like, money or bonds, or something, or if they had to, trade it for, like, weapons or something, so they could, in theory, produce a rebellion, but it basically doesn't matter, because the Tokugawa themselves are able to produce millions of cocoa a year, so any, any rebellion would, in theory, eventually just fail and, fl you know, fall flat on its face, just because of the huge disparities in wealth between the centralized government and everybody else. It just wouldn't work, so... The, the Tozama Daimyo basically realize this, and it's not ever in their interest to really do this up until the 1860s when there are serious problems with the shogunal government. Then they're able to rebel and launch the Meiji Restoration because there are cracks in the system as a result of outside pressure, so the West kind of coming in here. Um, so, in order to really do anything, like I mentioned a few minutes ago, the daimyo needed the express written permission of the Tokugawa. So, you want to expand your castle or do anything else, you need permission... Oh, it's the cat again. You need express written permission to basically do anything. Now, going along with this, there is the uh, Sanken Kotai system. Honey, are you going to get out of the camera for me or no? So, you saw the cat? Hopefully that brightened your day a little bit. <laughs> so what is the uh, Sanken Kotai system? So basically what this is, is it's a way of ensuring that, yeah, the, the Tozama Daimyo and the Fudai Daimyo and everybody else have land which produces a ton of wealth, but we need to ensure that they're not, you know, hoarding that wealth and planning anything, so we need to ensure that they're broke all the time. How do you do this? Well, on the one hand, yeah, you have to support the samurai and everybody else, so, like, that, that takes a chunk of your wealth away, but you still have a lot of rights, you have a lot of wealth, you have a lot of money. In order to drain that wealth from everybody, what the Sanken Kotai system basically makes all the daimyo do is have their residence in their province, it's got to be nice. So it's got to have a lot of buildings. It's got to be gilded. The woodwork has to be beautiful. You have to employ artisans to keep up on everything. It has to be very pretty. It has to be worthy of uh, a daimyo living in it. So you have to have that. And then in the capital city of Edo, modern day Tokyo, you have to have the same thing. And you got to keep up on that too. And then every year or every two years or every three years, depending on your... Um, individual system of contract with the shogun, you have to make this grand, opulent procession from your home province to Edo. 
it's got to be a very grand, very pretty, very elaborate procession. You got to bring all your people with you on the road system. Everybody, everybody's got to know when you're moving, who you are, where you're from, how many people you have. You're supposed to like. In some cases, give away wealth. You're supposed to display that. You're supposed to display opulence. And then when you get to Edo, you gotta live there for like half a year. And you gotta do stuff with the Shogun in Edo too. So this is all of a way... So this is all a way of basically ensuring that, you know... Yeah, you might in theory have like 100,000 koku a year. But really not so much. Because you have to get rid of all of it to keep up on uh, appearances. So it's another way of just keeping everybody in control. If everyone's poor, if everyone's broke, well then there's no, there's no, uh, you know, possibility of rebellion. And this, again, is something that the Tozama Daimyo, the enemies at Sekigahara, recognize very, very, uh, you know, well. There are all kinds of, if you look at the primary sources, I guess rituals probably would be the right way to describe this, of Tozama lords out in, like, western Japan, in the western Japanese islands of every year. The daimyo, so the, the head of the family, and all his retainers pledging allegiance to each other once more. And the retainers of the samurai and other lords are like on their knees with their sword. And they're asking the daimyo, has the time come for rebellion? And the daimyo will respond something along the lines of, no, not yet, my child, the time is not ripe. And on top of that, so on top of all of this, we have the uh, buke shohato. So the buke shohato is a 1615 law code, which, which gets um, updated and revised as the decades and the centuries kind of wear on. But basically, what this is making the samurai do is it's making them study um, martial arts on, on the one hand, so they still get to be warriors, even though there's no war, no conflict in Japan, really. Um, so they have to study martial arts, but they also have to study uh, learning. So you have to... No Chinese calligraphy. You have to have this, like, extensive knowledge of Chinese and Japanese literature. You have to know art. You have to know... etc. All these different traditional facets of Chinese and Japanese learning and schooling to basically ensure that the samurai can fulfill their role uh, as advisors to everybody effectively. And all of these guys have to be based in a castle town, so... Because the samurai are paid in koku, they're paid in rice stipends, not actual money. Um, this is another way of ensuring that the samurai, the, the warrior class or status group in Japan, basically stays broke because they quickly go broke because they're paid in food and not money. So that's, I guess, kind of it for, you know, horizontal integration. Now what we're going to focus on is the vertical stuff. So this is, you know, as the term, I guess, implies, uh, the construction of... Japanese society along a, a, I guess, a pyramid scheme, a, a, a pyramid system probably would be the best way to describe it. Um, so in order to really do this, in order to ensure that you have all these different social groups kind of layered on top of each other and to ensure that everybody knows their proper place, uh, what do you do? Well, the Japanese implement Neo-Confucianism. So this is something we're going to be talking about a lot in the first couple episodes of this series, especially as we get more towards, like, the development of Japanese imperialism, for reasons that will become apparent in both this video and uh, later videos, but traditional Confucianism is a... it's not a religion. A religion implies that there's, like, a heaven, there's a hell, there's some kind of a deity, uh, maybe there's like a holy book. Confucianism, old school Confucianism, as it's developed in the Chinese warring states, so like 400 to 200 BCE roughly, uh, is not a religion, it's a philosophy. It's a way of ordering and structuring society and your life to basically ensure harmony. And it's focused, it's based around these five uh, different relationships. So, ruler to subject, husband to wife, father to son, elder to brother to younger brother, and friend to friend. So, the idea here being that there's always, like, a system of, uh, you know, hierarchy, and the subject always must be loyal and deferent to the ruler, the wife to husband, etc. Um, one party is always, like, in charge, the other party is always kind of deferential to the other party in charge. So, 
Neo-Confusionism takes that, but it, it combines it. Again, this is something we'll talk about more uh, in future videos as we get more into the philosophical justifications for, like, Japanese imperialism and then the launching of uh, World War II and the strike on Pearl Harbor. Um, Neo-Confucianism kind of takes that and it blends it with, like, these developments in Buddhism uh, and, and Taoism, and it kind of develops, like, this quasi-religion-slash-philosophy thing. Um, but the Tokugawa take that and its system of vertical integration and they apply it to Japan. So in the Edo period, so the whole period that the first chunk of this series is going to be looking at, uh, we have a series of hierarchical relationships. We have the shogun on top, then we have the daimyo, then the samurai, peasants, artisans, and merchants. Uh, where's the emperor in this system, you might be asking? That's something people are going to be asking, but it's going to come into effect in the next couple videos as we start talking about revolution. So, that's the basic structure, that's like the basic pyramid. You have the shogun, the daimyo, the samurai, peasants, artisans, and merchants, the emperor, monks, uh, and the barakumin, who are these, these people that are... I have to be careful with how I describe this, because these people have been uh, persecuted for centuries in Japan. So, barakumin is kind of a not nice way of describing these people, but it's it's also one of the nicest terms, because the other one would be like eta, which means like filth. Uh, barakumin are people that live kind of outside the established order of things. These are guys that dwell in villages, um, and these are people who are kind of shunned and cast out from Japanese society because they do things, they deal with occupations and, and trades that typically have been looked down upon. So these guys are like butchers, leather workers, grave diggers, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So all of these other groups are part of this pyramid, but at the same time, no. And we'll talk about why that is in future videos. Uh, but I want to be very, very, very clear about something here. This social pyramid, shogun, samurai, whatever, these are not, and I cannot stress this enough because this is going to impact uh, intellectual developments later on, these are not social classes. Social classes are very much a Western... Um, 19th century industrial revolution thing. What these are, going with the language of Neo-Confucianism and Chinese statecraft and Japanese statecraft, uh, these are mibun. These are status groups, according to Japanese and Confucian custom and, you know, culture. So these aren't, like, a class. This is a group of people that you are born into, and because of that, you are believed to have a certain set of virtues, you are believed to have a certain set of um, code and stuff that you are to follow, and you can't leave that status group. If you were born a samurai, you will die a samurai. You cannot choose to become a peasant, usually. So, these are, you know, groups of people, kind of like castes, where you're basically born into it and you don't leave. Uh, so, laws are issued for each Mibun to basically maintain harmony, and the samurai become uh, Junsha. So these are scholarly warriors, and they serve the daimyo and the samurai, and you know, like we've talked about in, in you know the previous minutes of this video, uh, the daimyo support the samurai through like rice stipends, the peasants farm the rice, they pay rice in taxes. So rice is the medium of exchange. Each domain technically has like its own currency, uh, but there isn't really a wide-ranging national monetary system. And this is where we're going to start getting into stuff like the Industrial Revolution in the next couple videos. And this is something we talked about a bit in the last couple videos of the previous series. Uh, the peasants are encouraged to show their virtue to society, to show their worth, by becoming industrious, hardworking. Uh, you know, many eventually develop multiple side gigs, so they develop multiple incomes aside from farming, so, like, sake brewing. So, this is something like, well, you know, there's a lot of food now for agricultural, um, you know, there, there's been agricultural advances, so crop yields increase, so people have more kids. Well, 
maybe you have more kids than you can kind of put on the farm. Maybe, and I'm not joking here, I'm being very, very serious. Maybe you have one kid that's like a raging alcoholic and they, they know alcohol. Maybe you have another kid who's like really good at math. Well, maybe you take some of the wealth you developed from farming and you kind of send those two kids off and you invest them in a sake brewery. So you have like this side income now, which is a tavern. This is how stuff like that develops. Um, and this has led people to question, and we're going to talk about this in you know this video a bit and in future videos. Uh, this has led some people to question whether or not Japan could have experienced an industrial revolution in this period. It's not clear. The answer is probably yes, it just probably would not have looked like the Industrial Revolution that develops in Western Europe. Okay, so the Tokugawa also have a system uh, of senior councillors. So these are drawn from the five most powerful Fudai Daimyo. So their job, basically, and these guys are not always in power. There are some chunks of the Edo period where there aren't senior councillors anymore, or maybe there's just like one or two, but in theory there's supposed to be five. Uh, these guys, their job is to help run the country. Although, like I said, they're not always called on to do so. Uh, the shogun also has junior administrators who oversee merchant, artisan, and peasant activity at more local levels. So in terms of Tokugawa government, this is very much a you know, top-down system here. This is where we get into all the vertical integration, and it works so well that the daimyo, basically as a rule, try to mirror this system, and central to all of this are the samurai. So the Japanese islands, like we said, are no longer at war, so what do you do with this group of people whose only purpose is to learn how to fight and kill, to practice warfare? Um, the answer is that the samurai become Junsha. So the Junsha are the Japanese version of the Chinese Confucian gentlemen, the Junzi. So these are people who advise the lords, they pursue scholarship, and then become role models for the rest of society. I realize I've repeated this a few times. And I'm doing that because in the next couple of videos, when Japan goes through this like intellectual revolution to justify not only the Meiji Restoration, but eventually, um, you know, the development of Japanese imperialism draws on these like undercurrents of, of Japanese thought and Japanese intellectual developments. These are the people that are doing that scholarship. So this is these guys are extremely important for everything from the development of Japanese nationalism, to understanding how we implement an industrialized economy in a period of like 40 years, to acquiring an empire, to dealing with the Western powers, etc. You know, et this is who the Japanese are calling upon to really do this. Um, so, in addition to all of this, the Japanese use several other things to kind of further secure their power. They use law, they use legal precedents, um, historical precedents, Neo-Confucianism, and Buddhism. So how exactly do all of these things help legitimate Tokugawa power and what's been called the uh, Tokugawa control system? So as we've gone over in the previous uh, you know, series, Japanese culture has several avenues for uh, political power and political legitimation. So you have the emperor, so maybe you get his backing. You have aesthetics, so beauty. I am better than you because I have knowledge of the arts and I control this beautiful object. So clearly I'm blessed by the gods. That kind of thing. Uh, there's religion. There's, of course, military power. Uh, and then going along with the aesthetics and the religion stuff, there is the power of culture. So initially, the Tokugawa shoguns, the first three anyway, uh, they actually go to the capital to formally receive the emperor's bestowing of the title of shogun upon them. They also make great use of that other traditional Japanese way of attaining power, aesthetics. So... Building gardens, beautiful architecture, a massive castle in Edo, well, you're blessed by the gods because you're able to have the wealth to do all this stuff. This is how a lot of that works. Uh, in some ways, it's kind of self-perpetuating. And in 1607, uh, this is kind of the crucial thing, and we'll talk about this more in, in future videos as well, because this really impacts Japanese nationalism. Um, in 1607, Tokugawa Ieyasu was on a hike, in the mountains with some of his retainers, and he hears a hermit, you know, this dude who kind of lives out in the in the woods and, like, lives in a cave, um, and is thus believed to be holy because he, he lives in the middle of nowhere. Uh, he hears this hermit say the following, This day has passed. My life has lessened, because, you know, it's one day less, and I'm creeping ever closer towards death. Um, we are like fishes in shallow water. What pleasure could this be? And Iyasu realizes that worldly pursuits 
and life in general is kind of like vain because at some point, you know, different different religions have different ways of kind of signifying that the end is near. In a lot of strains of Buddhism, especially strains of Buddhism that are in Japan, you kind of hear the music and you're like, well, crap, I lived a good life. Uh, the Buddha's coming down on a cloud and he's going to come take me away. So that's how you kind of understand that, you know, death is approaching. So what he realizes, and my, my point with this is that he realizes that, like, all these worldly pursuits count for nothing once you die. Um, and he becomes very devoted to Tendai Buddhism, and he starts constructing shrines and temples and stuff all over Japan. When he dies, and this is crucial, and this is, you know, keep this in mind because this is going to impact how Japanese nationalism begins to develop, um, he becomes deified as a dragon. And in East Asian culture, specifically Japanese, dragons are not necessarily seen as these like malevolent evil creatures. They, they can be. More often, though, these guys are symbols of protection and, and defense. So, he builds this shrine on uh, Nikko Mountain. He's entombed on Nikko Mountain. And this is a mountain we're going to talk about in future videos, too. Um, and that shrine and his, his tomb, and thus where he's believed to become this dragon and, and to live, um, is situated under the North Star. I cannot stress this element enough. This is incredibly important. So, this is the place, the, the North Star, where Neo-Confucianism believes and states that all reality comes from. Why? Well, if you look at the night sky, and if you were to set up, like, a camera and take a picture every second, you're going to see the stars rotate. But one star in the middle doesn't move. That's Polaris, the North Star. Because it doesn't move, but everything else does, well, that clearly must be the center of the universe. That must be, in Neo-Confucian thought, the center where all the reality flows and stems from. That must be the center of everything. So Tokugawa Ieyasu... His temple is situated under the North Star. Well, in nativist thought, in what eventually becomes Shintoism, the Japanese are like, oh, well, Neo-Confucianism has this. We have this too. We have the Tenno. This is the word that's kind of translated for emperor. It doesn't really mean emperor. It kind of means something like Heavenly Sovereign of the North Star. So the Japanese Emperor is associated with the North Star too. So, you know, keep this in mind for later because we'll, we'll talk about this in, in, you know, more detail. But basically the way nationalism develops is like, oh, well, Neo-Confucianism states that, the, the, you know, the North Star is where all reality flows from. Well, the Emperor is associated with it. So really the Emperor must be where all reality and everything flows from. So really Japan's at the center of the universe, not China. So, you see where that's going. So, I want to keep going a little bit here with, you know, religion and different systems of belief, because this is all about how the Tokugawa set up and build their, uh, you know, control system. So, in Japan, yeah, I mean, technically, after the Europeans show up in the 1500s, we have the uh, Kitashitan, the hidden or underground Christians, even though that's, like, officially persecuted in Japan. So, there is Christianity, but, like, not really. Uh... There is maybe some Hinduism, not really. Really, in, in Japan, the big three belief sets are Buddhism, Shinto, and Neo-Confucianism. All three of these are used to back up Tokugawa control, like we've talked about, but they also create their own problems. Um, so, when Buddhism develops in India, Siddhartha Gautama, the historical Buddha, was a guy. He was a man. He was mortal. He ate. He drank. He defecated. He urinated. He bled. He was injured. He eventually died. But he gained enlightenment. And so he becomes Buddha, one who is enlightened. But my point here uh, is that he was a mortal guy. He was a human. Initially. Eventually, Buddhism argues he became a god. Well, some strange of Buddhism. When Buddhism leaves India, it goes in two directions. It goes into Southeast Asia, where it's still kind of, like, traditional. Um, and then it kind of travels along the Silk Road and goes through, like, Tibet and China and Mongolia and Korea. And then it enters Japan. 
So as it goes north and eventually east, and it enters Japan, Buddhism changes to really become more of like a religion. There really is kind of an organized system of priests. Uh, there are, you know, various Buddhas. They take on various forms. They basically become deities. So in Japanese Buddhism, Buddhas can have different power levels. There are Buddhas for everything. Um, and we have a couple here. So we have, you know, Dainichi. He's the cosmic eternal Buddha. Kind of like a god in the traditional sense, but not really again, because this gets into issues with uh, Buddhist theology. We have uh, Amida Buddha, my personal favorite. He's the Buddha of the Western Paradise. Mortals can gain enlightenment and salvation by saying his prayer right before they die. Uh, we have Yakushi, he's the Buddha of healing. Uh, and then we have guys like Bodhisattva. So these are people who achieve enlightenment, but they choose to remain on earth to help others. And then we have Tokugawa Ieyasu. So this guy dies, like we've talked about. And he becomes Tosho Daigongen, the Illuminator of the East, the August Avatar of Buddha. So he becomes a dragon. So in Japanese Buddhist thought, he's an avatar uh, of Yakushi, the Buddha of Healing. And Tosho Daigongen is also a Shinto Kami, a Shinto God. So in this belief that Shinto and Buddhism work very well together, you know, but they have issues. Uh, Shinto is decentralized and maintains that people can be happy and live in harmony with nature. Demons have two faces, one good, one bad. You know, this stuff is all that, you know, this is all stuff that's going to come up and come back again when we talk about justifications for World War II. Uh, Buddhism, though, believes that life is suffering and that it is the state of people to be naturally unhappy. So, you know, they work together, but there are issues here. Buddhism and Shinto really can work together, but Neo Confucianism poses a bit of a problem. Um, so, this is something that develops out of Song Dynasty, so the 1100s, roughly, uh, philosophy. And it emphasizes the five relationships, like, you know, which we've talked about in previous minutes on this video. It also emphasizes uh, the Taiji, so this is the central point from which all reality flows. It's symbolized by the North Star. And, you know, this is a system which Japanese nationalists and Japanese intellectual developments eventually argue, uh, which serves Japan imperfectly because it's a Chinese system, and thus it's designed for China, not Japan. So, you know. But we get some new intellectual developments here, um, like Kokugaku. So Japanese philosophy, which is Kokugaku, this eventually develops into what's called, um, you know, like native learning, which we'll talk about more in, you know, the next couple of videos. Um, this emphasizes the North Star, like we've talked about. This is like, you know, associated with the emperor. It's related to the symbol of the, again, emperor of the Tenno, the heavenly sovereign of the North Star. And if this is where all reality stems from, um, these are intellectual developments which are going on in Japan, which back up Tokugawa control, but also gradually undermine it. Um, and if energy is divided into male and female, so the, the Taiji, the North Star, kind of gets broken up into the yin-yang, so we have male and female energy, both of which complement each other. Um, in Kokugaku thought, male energy is unnatural because it's... it's uh, how do I want to phrase this? It's artificial. It's created. Female energy is natural. Because female energy, well, women give birth. They're the uh, progenitors of life. There is nature associated with females. Stuff like that. Well, then, Japanese, um, which is feminine. And we'll talk about more of this in future videos, because this is a really tough nut to crack. Uh, we have stuff like the Manyoshu, which is an ancient Japanese poetry collection. So, ancient... So so Japanese intellectuals were looking back at their history, and they're like, oh, well, our first literature is all about nature, so, you know, again, the female energy thing in Japan. Uh, Japanese language is much less ordered and much less structured than Chinese. We have Shinto, which is a nature religion thing. Um, well, then, according to Kokugaku scholars, which seek to help back up the Tokugawa control system, well, Japanese is superior to Chinese. Um, this begins a shift in intellectual currents in, like, the 1700s. So we're going to talk about that stuff again in more detail as we move forward through videos. Uh, but in addition to all of this like abstract philosophical stuff, which has issues as we've talked about, uh, the Tokugawa also used concrete visible rituals and ceremonies to back up the right to rule. So, you know, Tokugawa Iemitsu, the third shogun, he formalizes the Sankin Kotai system, so this idea that, you know, the daimyo have to travel between their domain and Edo, they have to maintain lavish residences in both areas, they gotta 
do so in these kind of grand gestures. You got to always have like artisans and people working on their structures and working on their domains. So it's something people can see. It's something people can easily recognize because it's not like some abstract thing like this is the star, this is the center of the universe and all reality flows from it. That's kind of abstract. This is very much like, well, you know, here's a castle and this guy is building a new entryway or something on it. I can see that. I can touch it. If I wanted to, I could lick it. I could taste it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, in 1645, the court recognizes Ieyasu's tomb at Mount Nico as having the same importance as the Ise Shrine, which is sacred to Amaterasu, the Japanese sun goddess, the uh, divine ancestor of the imperial family. So you can see how people can start playing with that, and they can start going to both shrines. The emperor also sends envoys each year to Nikko and to Edo, uh, thus backing up the imperial legitimation of Tokugawa power. Well, the emperor is sending his guys to us, so we must have the correct power structures. We must be, you know, the guys in charge, because the emperor is favoring us. All of these movements... You know, we're expected to be pompous, they're expected to be extravagant, you're expected to be displaying wealth in honor of the Tokugawa. Uh, and lords, like we talked about, also have to maintain estates equal in Edo to their own domestic estates. So eventually, you know, the culmination of all of this is the daimyo and the samurai basically go broke. Uh, you know, many samurai sell their swords, armor, some allow merchants to marry into their families, which you're not supposed to do. But you do it because the merchants bring wealth, they bring money, so maybe it gets you out of debt. This is how the system develops. Um, it works very well, but at the detriment of the samurai. But it works pretty well for everybody else, so it's pretty good. And then lastly, uh, before I close this video, I want to talk a little bit about um, the seclusion of Japan during this period. So you read, like, generalized history textbooks, and, you know, it's talking about, oh, well, after the Battle of Sekigahara in 1600, the Tokugawa are fearful of Christianity, and Western ideas, and Western presence, and whatever. So they close Japanese ports off from the world. Japan becomes isolated. And that's an oversimplification. Like, yes, but, like, not really at the same time. So for most of ancient and medieval Japanese history, um, Japanese and mainland states, like China and Korea, were relatively peaceful, relatively friendly. Yeah, you have some stuff like pirates going on, and but there's really not a whole lot of conflict. Um, in 1592... Toitomi Hideyoshi launches an invasion of Korea. This starts changing things. Uh, nobody's really certain why he does this, but there are theories. The war ends in 1598. We have approximately 50,000 Japanese dead, possibly five times as many Koreans. This is a big maybe. Um, it's possible the numbers are, you know, higher. Korea was basically burned to the ground during this conflict, which is called the uh, Imjin War. So we have that going on. Uh, in, a little earlier in 1450. A little earlier, in 1543, uh, the Portuguese arrive at Tanagashima. By 1550, we have Catholic missionaries active in Japan. So many Japanese like guns. So they're cool with trading with the Europeans for that. But they're also wary of Christianity. Potentially, it's an imperialist religion, you know, especially uh, Catholicism. There are some Protestant guys that come over who tell the Japanese, well, yeah, you know, the Spanish and the Portuguese have used Catholicism to kind of pave a road to actual invasion, and the Japanese are all hold up. That's not cool. So, in 1587, Hideyoshi orders all the missionaries to leave Japan to try to maybe get rid of this. Between 1580 and 15, 1630, rather, you know, Christians in Japan are persecuted. And then between 1600 and 1633, Japanese trade actually flourishes here. So these are Red Seal ships. So the idea behind a Red Seal ship is... Trade's beginning to be restricted, but if you have this this document with a red seal on it stamped by the, you know, the office of the shogun, then you're cool to go trade. But between 1633 and 1639, shogun Iemitsu largely closes off the country. So this is the uh, Sankin Kodai edicts. There are six of them. This is not total. This is not a total closing off of Japan. There is trade with China and the Dutch, but it's enough to largely isolate it. So my point with this is that Japan's isolated, but kind of, not really. And we'll talk about this more in future videos. Um, but this is basically the situation, uh, the Tokugawa control system, which begins to set up conditions for the development of intellectual trends and industrial trends, which culminate uh, in the Meiji Restoration in 1868. And then from there, 
the creation of the Japanese Empire in East and Southeast Asia during the late during the late 1800s and the early 1900s. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it's been a little bit of a long ramble, um, but I will see you all next time.